Welcome to Native Talk Arizona, presented by Native Health and KRDP 90.7 FM. I'm host Lanasha Puati. Later in the show, I'll chat with Muriel Miguel, Artistic Director of the Spider Woman Theater, the longest running Native feminist theater group in the country. Welcome back to Native Talk Arizona, presented by Native Health and KRDP 90.7 FM. I'm host Lanasha Puati. New Art is Culture, Culture is Art is a documentary film about the life and legacy of Lloyd Kiva Nu, a pioneer of modern Native American fashion design. Nineteen forty two to nineteen forty five, he was on the USS Sanborn. Lloyd Kivenu was very important to Native fashion. He could be seen as the father of contemporary Native fashion. What Lloyd Kivenu did was to bring about an arts movement. In 1946, he went to Scottsdale. They, they loved his personality, they loved his, his spirit, his energy. Lloyd Kiva Enterprises develops after 1948. And you really start to see a push of arts and crafts in Scottsdale that we hadn't seen before. He wasn't trying to replicate something old or look to the past to perpetuate the past. He was looking to the future. Get up. On the phone with me are producer Lori Tapahanso and Nathaniel Fuentes writer, director, and producer of the documentary and owner and founder of Hey Ha Productions. Welcome to our show, Lori and Nathaniel. Thank you. Vanessa, thank you. And before we get started, can you both tell us a little bit about yourselves, your journey, and your backgrounds? We can start off with um, Nathaniel. So my name's Nathaniel Fuentes. My background right now in film as a career but as anyone's story goes it stretches a little bit more profoundly than that to get to this point so my family's uh from santa clara pueblo and zia pueblo i also have um, a little bit of Diné on my great grandfather's side and some some other a little bit of some indigenous mix from south of the border um, but uh, I was raised in Los Angeles, and the other part of the time when I wasn't in Los Angeles, I was back in Santa Clara Pueblo. But I ultimately made my life out in New Mexico, um, where I had been living um, as a resident for the last, oh man, it's been probably about 15 years, 16 years now. I'm a graduate of IAIA class of 2020 in cinematic arts and technology. Thank you for sharing that, Nathaniel. And Lori, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Sure. Um, thank you again for having us on. Uh, for everyone out there who are Akama and Navajo and all of our other relatives. Um, my name is Lori Tapahanso, and I'm from New Mexico. Um, Shiprock is where I was born and also raised um, in and around Acoma. Uh, currently located in New Mexico, but it's kind of been full circle to get here. Um, having left and gone to Haskell, um, Indian Nations University, then it was junior college in Kansas. Um, graduated uh, there with a theater degree and then went on to KU, uh, University of Kansas, and got a bachelor's in communication studies and later a master's there in Kansas as well um, in um, at Baker University. My background is really the last 21 years in higher education, so having worked at a number of tribal colleges and then also um, 
at Lane Community College in Oregon for four years. That brought me home, and the first fall I was home, saw Nathaniel's film. And up to that point, I had been um, working with with other folks in the industry, entertainment industry, to, um, you know, on the periphery of production work for either events that supported um, or were for Native actors or industry professionals. Um, or assisted with PR for different productions, um, having a journalism background. But Nathaniel took a chance, and I asked him if, if I could um, jump on and help him bring this film to the finish, and um, he, he obliged. So I'm happy to have worked with Nathaniel up to this point for pretty much the last year. It's been in December will be 12 months since we began working on this, um, the final phase of this production, and um, we can see the finish line. So it's it's been amazing, and uh, it's been a pretty cool uh, pivot in my career. So I now work full time in the entertainment industry now. And it's a pleasure to have you both here today. Uh, but before we kind of go into more about the about the project or the production, um, Nathaniel, can you tell us about um, your production company, um, Heha, and where is it located? The production company, company Heha, is a uh, native-owned business that is based out of Santa Clara. So um, it's a Tewa word um, for a concept of living, and its translation into English is without illness or no illness. So what kind of projects have you done? Oh, oh gosh. Um, well, uh, I've done a variety of different kind of projects uh, since starting film. I've done a lot of music videos with a lot of uh, local artists in New Mexico and international. Um, I've done events with um, and other productions, but um, during that time as well, uh, regard yeah, like event productions and fundraising. But uh, some of the some of the more earlier works were a lot of music videos and small little short productions. I, I've also done productions for real estate and that, that was that's a lot of uh, that was kind of like the bread and butter kind of pay the bills kind of work. Um, but uh, one of the latest films that I've done uh, is a film called Peace River that uh, was filmed here in New Mexico, or filmed in New Mexico, during um, the whole middle of the pandemic in 2021. Uh, it was filmed in Cimarron, and it was over the course of pretty much, let me think about this, I think of pretty much like eight weeks, uh, two months of shooting. Um, out there in Cimarron and around the uh, immediate location, breathtaking views of the landscape that um, most people don't have a chance to to witness. And um, that was an amazing film to do. Um, and on that film, I did camera, and I also acted in it, which most people don't know. <laughs> Can you tell us about this upcoming new one that you have? Um, new art is culture, culture is art. New art is culture, culture is art. It's a film about a gentleman named Lloyd Henry New, also known as Lloyd Kiva New. He is overlooked in, in American history for the contributions that he's done uh, through the course of like seven decades. He is credited as being the first Native American high fashion uh, designer. And he started his, his business along with a lot of other businesses <laughs> that he was connected to in one way or another in Scottsdale, Arizona. 
Well, there is now a historical landmark located where he built what is known as the Kiva Center. Uh, here, he started a unbelievable fashion line, or at least it expanded from this point. He didn't start it there, he, but it expanded to this point, and he created an amazing surrounding that inspired so many other kinds of folks. And that influence would come into play like later on down the line. But Lloyd, uh, being a Cherokee Irish individual, uh, was able to accomplish a lot of things with his heart in the place of expanding indigenous concept of being, I guess you can say. And uh, it was it was outside of that of a colonial experience. And this is where his passion uh, was underlined by fashion. And his fashion became a tool to express his perspective and indigenous perspective, because uh, he was inspired by that and it was reflected in his fashion, which ultimately were in places like Mulan and Paris and New York. Tokyo, San Francisco, um, Hong Kong. So if you can imagine what that's like for an individual in the 40s, 50s, 60s, um, he, he grew a pretty inspirational, inspirational um, custom business that uh, ended up the, uh, creating and helping to develop other businesses that were around his in uh, Old Town Scottsdale, which also led to uh, Scottsdale being known what it's for, for its uh, art and fashion, amongst other things. Uh, so the film takes a look at Lloyd's contributions, both in, as an entrepreneur in Scottsdale but also a look at his contribution to indigenous, um, indigenous education in the government system by inspiring a, a conceptual school of indigenous perspective inspired art in a new era, in a new uh, contemporary and modern unlimited expression through art. And not just art, but the ability to create these expressions and fine art using uh, using those types of materials and bringing these materials and ideas to young indigenous people at the time and um, and I just feel his contributions and his work uh, is uh, is due for celebration and not just celebration but also you know to bring it out into the open and that it should be more general knowledge and not specific Wow, and it will uh, be premiering, or you will be showcasing it in the next in the next week, in the next two weeks. Can you share with us the upcoming film screening that's going to be coming up here in Scottsdale? Yeah, um, you want me to well, do that one, Nathaniel? Well, I, I was definitely going to give uh, just kind of <laughs> give an introduction, but I mean, yeah, do yeah, it, so do more, that. yeah. <laughs> Um, so this film screening uh, of new art and art, new art is culture and culture is art, is going to be at uh, at the Scottsdale uh, uh, Performing or Center for Performing Arts, correct? Um, and that is going to be December seventh, twenty twenty three. And I think the screening begins about 5 or 5.30. And then after uh, around 7.30 is uh, the start of the VIP um, gathering for, uh, there's for, uh, for the evening. And at, the, at that point, um, I'll let the, the details go more into uh, Lori and of course if she wants to add more to the to the screening which I'm sh I, I definitely would like her to because uh, I'm very 
I guess you could say I'm not very, I'm kind of dry, I guess. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, I can help out. Yeah. So, yeah. So, Lori, why don't you go ahead and uh, um, kind of fill that in? <laughs> sure. So we're excited to um, bring the premiere of the finished final cut of the film to Scottsdale, where the story actually began. And that's going to take place on December 7th. It'll be in two venues. So we'll start at 6 p.m. The doors open at 5.30 for the screening, but the screening is at 6 p.m. It's an hour-long film. So at um, the Center, uh, the Scottsdale Center for Performing Arts. And then right after, immediately after that, at 7 o'clock, we'll have a talk back. And that'll feature um, Nathaniel. Also, one of our local historians there in Scottsdale and a Lloyd Cuvenu historian, Joan Fudala. So we'll have those two on the panel. Um, one of our, our executive producer, our associate producer, um, we'll have those two on the panel and our associate producer, Ryan Flayhive, who's actually the IAIA archivist who helped Nathaniel gather a lot of the historical documents, will moderate the conversation. That'll go till 7.30. And then at 7.30, we'll open the doors for the VIP event a couple of blocks away at the Museum of the West, Western Spirit, Scottsdale Museum of the West. And the doors open at 7.30, a silent auction, which will have amazing couture fashions for bid, will begin. And um, our uh, program will start not too long after that. And we're really excited about the program. The program will feature three amazing designers um, that will showcase their work. Uh, we'll have a short fashion review featuring Dorothy Grant, who was mentored by Lloyd Kivenu, and she will have about you know 10 to 12 fashions that she'll show of her work. Um, we'll have mo live models. It'll be a runway. It's going to be really exciting. And then following her will be one of the newest ones to come on the scene, that is Angela Howe Parrish, and she is the designer for Choke Cherry Creek Designs. She's Crow and Blackfeet, and um, Dorothy Grant is Haida. Um, and so we'll have those two um, at the beginning, and then our headliner the, that'll end the show with a bang will be Dante Bis. Grayson, who's the designer for Sky Eagle Collection, and he will showcase um, quite a few looks, and he's got an avant-garde style, so we're excited to see what he'll put together for us, um, but the show will all end at about 9.30, bidding ends at 9.30 as well, and we will close the doors at 10, so we're, we're excited to be able to offer um, your listeners a special discount that will be um, you can advertise a little bit later um, this week and um, for those who are listening so we we hope folks will come out and join us for an evening of amazing indigenous fashion thank you for sharing that Lori. Um, but and finally can how can our listeners find more information about hee-haw production and any new documentary and how can someone reach out and contact you Nathaniel so I have a social media uh, you can reach me through social media on Instagram uh, that is n eight b f l i m and that's native film the the other one the other social media that I can be reached at is I Z O F N eight, and that is Eyes of Nate. Perfect. Thank you for that. Can you that, spell? Oh, can you spell the first one again, please? It's N eight B H L I M F I L M. Oh, yeah. F-I-L, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, go ahead. One more time. <laughs> yeah, uh, sorry about that. N -8, or N eight V F I L M. sorry about that. So, native film. No worries. Thank you for that, Nathaniel. Uh, and Lori... Also, oh, oh sorry. <laughs> uh, I was also saying uh, you can also uh, 
find me on the Adobe site uh, under uh, Nathaniel Fuentes Art, myportfolio.com, along with um, for this. Um, well, I guess I guess that would that would probably be it for now. Always thank you for that, Nathaniel. Um, and Lori, can you let us know where we can go to find out more information about the screening? Sure. Yeah, folks can log on t- online, visit our website at kivanewfilm.com. That's K-I-V-A-N-E-W-F-I-L-M.com. And all the links to Nathaniel's social media, his portfolio and to the ticket website is there so we're excited to to welcome the community out that sounds so amazing sounds like it will be a very fun and exciting event Uh, but i would like to thank you both Lori and nathaniel for taking time out to talk to us today um Lori and nathaniel telling us more about this great great and exciting um screening coming up Well, thank you for having us. Yes, thank you very much for giving us time. Coming up, Muriel Miguel will tell us about the Spider Woman Theater, the longest-running Native feminist theater group in the country. Support for KRDP 90.7 FM comes in part from Native Health, with two locations in Phoenix, 4041 North Central Avenue, Building C, near the corner of Central Avenue and Indian School Road and at 2423 West Dunlap Avenue. Native Health is also located in Mesa at 777 West Southern Avenue, near the corner of Southern Avenue and Extension Road. Native Health provides primary medical, dental, behavioral health, WIC, and wellness services for the urban Native American community. For more information, call 602-279-5262 or visit our webpage at nativehealthphoenix.org. Welcome back to Native Talk Arizona, presented by Native Health and KRDP 90.7 FM. I'm host Lanasha Pawati. Muriel Miguel is the Artistic Director of Spider Woman Theater, located in Brooklyn, New York, the longest-running Native feminist theater in the country. Hello, Muriel. It's an honor to have you on our show today. Hi, how are you? I'm doing great. (laughs) (laughs) And before we get started, um, please tell us about yourself, your journey, and your background. Well, uh, all my names. (laughs) Uh, My name is Muriel Miguel. My name is Bright Sun. My name is Waga Nadili. And uh, that's it, but that's a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, uh, I uh, grew up in Brooklyn. Uh, well, first of all, I am Kuna and Rappahannock. The Kunas are, fr- are from a place called Kunayala, uh, which is off the coast of Panama, and it, it's a sovereign nation. Uh, and Rappahannocks are from Virginia, uh, uh, of the Rappahannock, Rappahannock River, Rappahannock Valley. So that's what I am. I am Kuna and Rappahannock. And uh, I realized that you kind of slurred over like, oh, Brooklyn. (laughs) And I grew up in Brooklyn. So I am truly, truly a city native. (laughs) That's what I am. (laughs) We all danced, we all sang, we we told the stories, and that's how we grew up. And though it was in the city, we have all that. that, You know, it's um, when I was growing up, I... uh, it was it was a time where the whole thing about uh, 
do your ceremonies and everything were against the law. And uh, and at the same time, there was the Wild West shows. And what we discovered as young kids was that people were, you know, going from the West to the East. And, and the worry of losing your culture because you're not allowed to do many of the ceremonies, you know. So uh, they came to New York City. A lot of them came to Brooklyn. There were those Wild West shows, and the same thing with the Wild West shows. And uh, so there are many Native people in Brooklyn. And the same thing about coming down from uh, Canada or coming up from Mexico, that uh, there are many Natives that coming both ways that met in Brooklyn. And, uh, and and that's important to learn because we, we were here. We were just here and, and sitting here. And with it uh, came all these people and we were like sponges and, and we really absorbed what these people were saying, how they showed us how to dance a lot of different ways. Uh, they they taught us songs. They taught they talked to us about stories, and the native people here in Brooklyn really wanted that. And they were very open, and so uh, a lot of us grew up with people that came from uh, Hopi, uh, you know, from uh, the West and the East, and and. Uh, and it was, and then it was very important, and and that's how we grew up. I don't know how much more I can talk about <laughs> myself. <laughs> Is that enough? No worries. That was that was perfect, Muriel. Thank you for sharing that, and it's amazing to hear your story of kind of like what your family went through, all the obstacles you guys had faced. So, how did you get into the theater? All of us, young ones. Uh, we talked about powwows. We talked about dancing and powwow dancing and learning songs. And uh, so we went and asked the parents, and the parents were so excited. We uh, we went to a, a, a church and asked them if we could use their ad, uh, not their attic, their cellar. And so we gathered a number of, of uh, people. And... Uh, Every Saturday, we would go down to that attic, attic, I want to call it attic, go down to that cellar and, and learn and talk, talk to each other. And our parents were very happy about that. And so, and it's called the Thunderbird American Indian Dances. And they have powwows and they collect money. And that money goes to scholarships for uh, students. So that was always there. And I I wanted to dance. I like that feeling. I like that feeling of moving in space. And I started to dance, you know, take modern dance and so on. But I was still dancing. You know, I, I was still in the group. We still worked. And uh, we did shows. We would make up our own shows. And, and, and then just invite all the parents to see us with, uh, with Bernie Why, uh, Ellen Stewart from the Mama, uh, you know, worked with us. She, we were very young. I think it was all before any of us had children. I, I danced, and it was very difficult for me because I didn't understand what these people were saying. And... <laughs> I, you know, I, I, or I, I, I wanted to dance. I wanted to make up things. So I was, I, I always felt like I was going, you know, upstream. <laughs> everyone, else, everyone else was coming downstream. I was, I was fighting to get upstream. And, and with that was that, that feeling of uh, not really fitting in and also feeling that I, I didn't want to talk about being Native. Uh, uh, dancing, uh, and especially when uh, I remember, uh, I I went to the Henry Street Playhouse. And it was the Alan Nikolai uh, was the uh, uh, director there, and he had all these different teachers. And I uh, I remember 
someone say, oh, you're native. And then she said, oh, I went to see the Green Corn Band. And I I got really excited, like, oh, wow, that's, that's great. I can talk to her. And then she said, it was so boring. It was it was so boring. They they never changed the rhythm. Uh, how come they do that? And my reaction was to definitely climb up. I I wasn't interested in talking to someone that didn't understand what I was trying, what I was going to try to say. So you you know going into dance was like that. But, but still, I was trying to really work as a dancer. So then uh, what happened, I had this wonderful teacher. She taught a, a process called Laban. And uh, there was a man called Joe Chaikin who had a group called Open Theater. And as soon as he started to talk about the, the exercises he wanted to do and you know put them out there on, on the floor, I, I knew what he was talking about. I really knew. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the exercises. I understood what they were talking about to me. And I went on tour with them. They did the circuit. It was pretty, it was pretty wonderful. It was, uh, I, I really enjoyed that. Well, that's how I started. So can you tell us like more about the Spider Woman Theater? Um, how long has it been in existence? <laughs> 46 years. <laughs> 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 oh wow! <laughs> <Make me laugh. laughs> and what kind of um, current plays is at the Spider Woman Theater? Well, I would call us a floating group because we don't have a theater ourselves. Do all of your plays um, that you guys do do they tell an indigenous story? Always, <laughs> it's true. In the beginning, it was not that way because I I uh, I just collected people that I, my sisters and other people that uh, I was teaching uh, at Bard. I just asked some of these young students to be uh, in. They weren't, they were not uh, indigenous. And uh, we stayed that way. We traveled that way. I mean, we really toured. When I say toured, I mean toured. Toured! <laughs> that, that, I mean, that, that's my idea in the beginning was that I was very angry. I was very angry at the way uh, I was being treated on the street. I was very angry at someone pinching me. Very angry at someone rubbing themselves against me. I was angry at the disgusting things you know men would say walking down the street. Now you know I'd be walking with my daughter and so I'd be thinking, God, you know she's going to have to go through this too. And so I started to ask uh, different women how they felt, and uh, and then realizing how how angry many women were. So I I started to again with that idea of storytelling, really ask women about their stories, and then uh, what I discovered was that during this whole st uh, time of liberation and you know with liber women's liberation that there were many stories there were many stories out there but they were so horrific that you, you, you felt like you, you know you couldn't get it out you couldn't get it out and then it started to feel like you were getting hit on the head with all these horrible stories and so it also felt that because you you couldn't express it in any way except with horror and the beatings, the murders, the uh, all, all of that, that it felt like you were being hit on the head. And that doesn't help. Being hit on the head doesn't help because all you can say is, ow, you're not listening to the stories that are coming in. You're not listening to other women because you're holding your head and saying, ow. So I was really interested in telling stories in a way that we can hear each other. And Muriel, can you tell us, um, I, I believe one of your current plays is The Town of Little Sagas? Yeah. Oh, I wrote that. It's a, it's a radio play. 
and uh, I ran out of money. I couldn't. <laughs> it's just a little thing. It's called the town of Little Saga, and it was like, what would what would be, what it would what would it be like if you had a native town that was like a utopia? <laughs> that was my premise, and I did a radio show about it. It was. I did it, you know, during the time of you know, the, the big epidemic and everything was closed down and I started to write. I was oh. going a little crazy. <laughs> oh, wow. And um, <laughs> and talking talking about your writing, um, where do you where do you find your stories and how long does it take to kind of like write and produce a play? The first piece, Women and Violence, was very fast. We got it together. The idea of stories was so important, and how to tell stories was so important. Uh, when we did uh, Women and Violence, we were really shocked at how, um, how people uh, reacted to us. The feminists, some of them said, uh, we weren't feminists because we were married. We weren't feminists because we wore makeup and so, so on. So we went right into that. And the questions were there, like, you know, like, what makes a feminist? What, what makes how we go into m- making a, a, a group? And, uh, and how do we look at that? So women and violence was like that. We were so shocked that we really polarized. A, a, we, as spider woman theater, polarized people. Because some people loved us and some people hated us, <laughs> and so, and then we were asked to go places, and sometimes we, you could see the you could see the audience separating. Uh, we realized that it was dangerous at times because uh, men were very angry at us for for doing for doing these plays and talking about things that we were talking about. That that was one thing. So we went from uh, city to city. We were still in New York City, and you know we were still here in the states. And uh, uh, I met Luis Valdez, and he was the guy from Teatro Campesino, and that was the workmen's, uh, you know, the, uh, that was that was trying to start a union, and and he was working with a lot of uh, uh, people from his group. And, you know, he had a big sombrero on. He had a big cigar. And <laughs> he came in to where we were rehearsing and said, hello, sisters. And it was like an instant, instant snap of the fingers. Happy to meet him. And we talked a lot because we were all indigenous. We were all working on, on, on our path. Uh, we talked about our exercises and how we got to it. We talked about how we had our questions and how we always were questioning things. So at the end of this, there was a talent scout there. And the talent scout was looking for a uh, different group to come to uh, France, to go to France, because they had uh, uh, a, a group uh, that was showing from all over the world. And uh, this is Nancy, uh, France. So the talent scout there asked me, uh, well, who would you recommend? And he said, if you don't take Spider-Woman, forget about it. Don't take anybody. So I received this letter in French and had no idea what it was. I was running around trying to get this uh, translated. And so I found out that they wanted us to come to go to France, uh, but we had to pay our own way. We had to pay everything, and uh, we didn't have money. So we decided to have a benefit, and we brought all kinds of people there. So I took with, uh, we got together, all of us, and we had uh, five women and uh, a stage manager and a business manager, seven of us. And uh, we went to France, and I, let me tell you, I was scared out of my mind. 
all of a sudden I realized that I was responsible for all these people. And uh, But uh, again, the same thing happened, that uh, Spider-Woman was polarized because the men were very angry in, in Europe. And, uh, it, you know, they came to heckle our show. And, and then the women, <laughs> the women in the show, you know, in the theater attacked them. So it was, again, we were so surprised that this was happening. And uh, from the, uh, one wo- young woman uh, told me a story, and I told the story before the show opened and, and how important it was. Uh, she got beat up in the street, and when she tried to go to the police to tell them she was beat up, they wouldn't, they wouldn't accept the, the, the police there. She brought him in, and then they listened to this young woman's story of being beat up in the street. So she told that story, I told that story, and then we told people, if they want to do something about it, just wait till the end of the show, and let's all talk about it. And that's what we did. So there was a big demonstration outside of the police headquarters, and uh, it was it was quite something and exciting. It was really exciting, and uh, yeah. So that was one thing that happened, but it was a big thing. People came to us, and the business manager, and and they. They wanted us to go all, they wanted us to go to Italy. They wanted us to go to Holland. They wanted us to go to Germany. And that's what we did. So we thought we were going to be there for maybe a couple of weeks, maybe a month, a month. And we were there for at least three months. And kind of talking on the same yeah. topic of kind of um, how you guys were traveling to, for these plays out there. And it sounds like a lot of your plays have been um, really kind of, um, I guess, inspired by kind of the experiences that you all have faced. Um, But I noticed on your website as well, you have another one called Misdemeanor Dream Tour, and it says coming fall of 2023. Can you tell us more about about this play? Uh Oh, sure. Well, now, talking about how long these things, how, how, you know, how do you keep at it? Well, Mr. Mina Dream started five, it's more than five years now. It's like, it's, it's about six years. I've been working on this piece for six years. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I must be out of my mind. But anyway, now this is happening uh, during a time now we only have Native women. In the beginning, when I was talking to you uh, uh, about the beginning, we were all... Um, we were all different, but we were not. There were there were three native people in that group, but now the whole group is native. I had an idea that I wanted to do something about Shakespeare, and uh, I wanted to do it, but looking at it from the point of view of a native person. And uh, I I looked at Midsummer's Night Dream, and uh, I was in Canada. And uh, what's the name of the group? It was a Stratford Festival. And uh, they were interested in, in my ideas. And I, I, I that's, and that's what I did. I was there. I, I collected a number of students that I've worked with for a while. And we all got together. We went to Stratford. But our idea of what Midsummer's Night Dream is like, uh, we took from a completely different point of view. We took it from the little people, the spirits, the, uh, you know, all, all the things that your parents do to keep the, you know, the backyard safe, but also the way, the way a lot of Native people look at nature. And uh, so we started to work on it. And uh, it was fine, but they, <laughs> Jackman didn't understand us. <laughs> And not only did they understand it, they, they didn't know what they were looking at, as one, one uh, director said. He didn't know what he was looking at. And I, I got the feeling, well, they, they wanted us to work there, but they, they wanted it their way. And I, I wasn't too happy about doing it their way. And it's not native. It's their way. So uh, 
we started to look at it differently. So we started to look at it in terms of little people and spirits and, and, and how do we receive those types of things and, and, and those stories. Those stories that you hear from under the table, in the closet, those stories. Now, this took me over five years to do because in the middle of all of that came the pandemic. And I didn't realize how I was opening, uh, you know, a can of worms because we started to talk about not only uh, the story, but the words and, and uh, do we want to do the words. Mural, speaking about the the words, did you keep the original um, Shakespeare words or did you add to it? No, no, no. We, we, did, we dumped it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you really want to know. <laughs> but I felt it, it's not going to be ours because there was a high hierarchy uh, and the, they... They're checking off their list, right? They're checking off. They have a group of native people, and you know they, they can. And and I felt that I I would we would not have anything, you know that that we we could not work work with it. They they're going to try to make us do what they want, not from our point of view. So I decided that I was I I wasn't interested in that, and I went on and did my own thing. And I called it misdemeanor dream. The other thing is that I was not interested in doing those words. I, as I was talking to the people that I was going to work with, it became quite clear that pe- the hurt from not knowing your language, the hurt from having the language taken away, the hurt from, from uh, being punished, all of that came about because we we didn't we wanted to see what how far the language could go our languages and i didn't know what kind of a can of worms i was opening up because there's a lot of lot of hurt and so we had that's what we had to talk about we had to talk about how some of us know our language and how some of us don't and uh that was really difficult that was a difficult part so we gave up that and then COVID struck, and there was a big strike there. And, and uh, again, we we tried to uh, see what we could do uh, on Zoom, and that became very hard to do. So we waited, we talked, we wrote, we wrote stories, and then finally, uh, when we could move uh, across borders, because we were working with people in Canada, uh, we started to write again and and talk about what we want and what we see. And one of the first things we started with was our, when we closed our eyes, what kind of a vision do we see of uh, how we landed here from somewhere? And that's Misdemeanor Dream. It's a cast of thousands. It's it's an you know intergenerational. Uh, there are young people, and the oldest is ninety six years old. That's my sister, and we're taking that on tour. Uh, do you know when um, you guys are planning the tour to take off? Like um, what dates and kind of what cities or areas you guys are planning on um, going for your tour? University of South Dakota. So we're going to. Uh, Wisconsin, and we're going to Minnesota. (laughs) Well, it sounds like you guys are pretty excited for this tour because you guys face a lot of different obstacles because of the pandemic happening, Um, but it did give you guys time more to to write, so I'm so happy to hear that you guys are starting your tour and hopefully in February and visiting all of these amazing places. Um, but Miro, can you let us or let our listeners know where they can go to find more information about your plays and the Spider Woman Theater and how they can contact you if they have further questions? We have a website, www.spiderwomantheater.org. 
Perfect. Thank you, Miro. We'll definitely um, have our listeners give you guys a look at your your Facebook, Spider Woman Theater, and also um, your website, as you mentioned, which was spiderwomantheater.org. Uh, but I would really love to thank Thank you, Mural, for coming on air with us today to tell us about your amazing journey of how you got into starting the Spider Woman Theater and all of just telling us more about your experiences and all of the great and amazing shows you guys are putting out. Thank you for listening to Native Talk Arizona, supported by Native Health and KRDP 90.7 FM. Audio editing by Javier Quiroga, and the executive producer is Susan Levy. And I'm host Lanasha Puati. We hope you tune in again next week. If you have any questions, please email us at nativetalkaz at radiophoenix.org.